Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to another edition of Let's Talk. And we do hope you'll be keeping us company right up until 10 o'clock today. In our first session this morning, we have uh, Anissa Musa from Islamic Caroline in studio. And we're going to continue our discussion, which we started last week, on raising children in this era, raising children in a troubled home, preparing children to go into a therapy or play therapy session when the marriage is very troubled because if we don't do that we're going to have our children growing up being pretty broken and not knowing how to navigate themselves in their own relationships so we'll try and pick up from where we left off and we do hope you're going to enjoy the next half hour with Anissa Musa from Islamic Care Line and Let's Talk. Salaamu Alaikum, welcome. Wa Alaikum Salaam once again Julie. Lovely Thanks to have you me. back mm -hmm. to talk about something that's really important. We stopped uh, last week when we were talking about how we communicate with our children when there's a troublesome or a disturbing event that's unfolding in the home, be it um, gender violence, be it substance abuse, gambling, lack of finances, wasting of finances, etc, etc, etc. And you also spoke about communication being the key, but also not overload our children with information because they can only make sense of a certain amount of the information and how perhaps therapy might be the answer. You know, um, Julie, since you mentioned and when you talk about uh, information overload, and I remember in the previous um, session, I spoke a little bit about what is your objective for chatting to your children. So I think what we need to keep in mind very importantly is that our role is not to discredit each other as co-parents. Um, because going forward, if we stay focused on the well-being of our Sadly, child. Sadly, that is a trait we all um, have. And it's almost like a payback time. So you did this to me, you wronged me. So I'm going to pay back by maligning the children against you. And, you know, we make it about us rather than focusing on the best interests of the children. And like I said, our role is not to discredit each other by telling them what they did and what they didn't do. And the second thing we or expect... Or how bad your dad is or how bad your mom, mom is. is. And the second thing we expect our children to do is to take sides and choose. And that shouldn't be what we want for them. It's we not their role. We need to ask ourselves, they will always be, the one will always be the father, the one will always be the mother. And we have a responsibility to fulfill our roles as the co-parents, as mom and as dad. And we need to help our children to build healthy relationships with each of their parents, whether you're together or you apart, so that when they grow up, they can, because remember that whatever we're teaching our children now, they're going to love when they're adults, they're going to do the same thing. So what we're actually doing is we're creating a vicious cycle and goes from generation to generation. And, you know, like I said, we have the immediate consequences of what happens and then the the later consequences. So immediately they feel very burdened. Children feel very, very burdened. They feel caught between their parents. They feel like they need to tiptoe around each of them because they want to, don't want to say the wrong thing to the one when they go to the one person's or the one parent's home if they divorced or if they separated then they hear about the other parent should i tell how will this person how will my mom respond if i tell her that my dad wants to take us out how will dad respond if my my mother is seeing somebody you know, all those things, we burden these little kids with things that are not even their responsibility. It's not even something that they, as young people, should have to deal with. Let alone, you know, we have adults who are struggling to deal with breakup, with breakdown, with heartache, with heartbreak. And then we expect our little children 
who don't understand what's going on. To be okay on. to bounce back. Yes. So Anissa, you know, what you're saying to me now is that there's a very fine balancing act here. On the one hand, we have information overload, and then you have those parents who just withhold absolutely all information. So nothing is being communicated to the children, and they're having to come to their own conclusions. You know, um, you know, what's also very, very important is for parents to take responsibility. So let's say, for example, um, and, and, and this is not meant to be gender biased in any way or, or take a stand on, on any particular thing. But the reality is, and, and we know in some of our previous discussions, we spoke about even like polygamous marriages. So the father marries another woman, but who's going to tell his children? They just happen to see him coming one day and one day doesn't or comes in really late and they don't know what's going on. It's our responsibility to sit them down and say, listen, this is a decision that I've taken. Get them, and, and, and this is what we need to understand when we talk about drawing that balance about involving them but not overburdening burdening them. What is the responsibility there, that as children in this family and in the system, and how are my actions going to affect them, that I owe it to them to sit them down. The other thing I also want to mention, and, and, and maybe I'm skipping the gun because we have a little bit of time, but you know, you get, and, and parents don't know what to do. Do I stay in the marriage because for there's my this, children? Exactly, there's a lot of women and men perhaps who say that or feel obligated to stay in a very troubled marriage for the sake of the children. How healthy or unhealthy is it? Would the children be better off um, the, the, for the parents to separate if it's a very troubled, volatile marriage? Or how do this couple then navigate forward? Do they keep up a pretense just for the sake of the children? Children are very perceptive. They're going to pick up on all of this. Okay, for me, um, I, I always believe that none of us are in a position to know the outcome of a relationship. None of us are in a position to tell somebody else that, um, you know, your children are going to be fine or they're not going to be fine or you should break your marriage. And I personally am not one to advocate the breakup of any marriage irrespective of where the children are being affected or not. However, again, it would come down to the best interests of the children. But again, I will say that it's important to sit your children down because there are some children who yearn for their parents to stay together. They really, even in therapy, we see it. They, they always have this hope that my parents will get back together and I'll live in the same home. And then there's other children who, as they grow older, they're angry with the one parent for staying. Let's say, for example, um, the father was cheating on the mother for many, many years, or he was, uh, he was abusing her, whether it was, just verbal, whether it was verbally or emotionally. And then years later, they're angry with the mom because you stayed in this relationship for all these years and see what he did to you, right? So my point is that we don't know what children are thinking unless we ask them. So I always advise parents that when you don't know, when you're sitting your children down, say to them, Ask them how they feel. They don't need to make your decisions for you, but you can make your decisions bearing in mind what is it that they experiencing and how it's affecting them. So what I'm saying is that it's again about the communication. I can't make a decision um, on behalf of my children when I have no clue what is it that they want unless I sit them down and say, look, this is what's happening. Again, without giving them too much information. So if let's say for example, um, and I always use myself as an example, not anyone else, but let's say for example, um, I have um, uh, an unfaithful spouse. Um, I don't need to tell these children, and this is another thing I'm just going to bring up, by the way, is that some parents involve their children to have a look at their messages or say, see, daddy's cheating, or see, this is a message from the other woman kind of thing. And you know what? I've got a big problem with that because, because it's that the just, boundaries it's being absolutely. crossed. Absolutely, and the respect. Mm. I mean, this is an issue between you and your spouse. Why drag the children in? Um, and also, the you know, they've got this amazing uh, father figure in their heads, in their minds. My father is a hero. Mm -hmm. And here mom comes along and she just uh, pops the balloon by showing them these mm -hmm. ugly messages. He may be a great dad, but mm -hmm. maybe as a husband, he's 
you know, he's, he's, he's failed in some ways, right? So what I'm saying is that there's always those boundaries, but to sit them down and say, look, we're going through our stuff. I don't want to tell you exactly what it is. He is your father. You'll always love him. I want you to continue to have that relationship just as you can continue to have that relationship with me. And no matter what happens going forward, just know that we love you and we'll do what's best for you. But I also want you, I also want to hear what you have to say about it, depending on how old they are, right? And you'll be surprised how they can open up. Yes, you're going to get instances where they might just steer and say nothing, depending on the child, their temperament, their mm -hmm. personality. Okay, let's go for our first ad break. When we come back, let's talk about, in a situation like this, um, is it prudent to then also perhaps age appropriate, obviously, um, send them for play therapy, but all of that and more coming up. Anissa Musa from the Islamic Care Line is in studio talking about raising children um, and, of course, troubled marriages or um, the issues that we've been unpacking for the past so many weeks, all about family matters. We do hope that you're enjoying these discussions. talking disturbing relationships, we're talking broken relationships, we're talking the impact on the children, we're talking about raising children in this era, but I'm wondering how different was it in our mothers and our grandparents' time? Did they approach these type of problems in a different way, Anissa? Um, I think they definitely did. Um, I wouldn't say that it was always necessarily the right way. I don't think there's any right particular way, but I, but I think from, from observations, um, the one thing that did stand out was they tended to contain or keep things very concealed. Um, I don't know if that was necessarily the best way, but Alhamdulillah, um, it sadly, just seems as though you, Sadly, I think I get the sense that when there's a troubled relationship, whether the child is troublesome, whether because there's an, an issue with the husband and wife and the child starts playing up, I think even today we try and contain it and keep quiet about it because there's shame, there's judgment. We don't want to expose. We, we have a troubled marriage as it is or we have a troublesome or a delinquent child as it is and we don't want people to know, even though maybe people could give us good advice, but we feel shame. We're ashamed about our situation because we're afraid we're going to be judged as being a, pa a bad parent or a parent that has failed their child or their partner. You know, Julie, I always, I'm an advocate of balance. And I always say that, yes, shame is a good thing because that's what we're missing in today's times. It's, in, in fact, for me, one of the reasons why things are gone so out of control is people have lost that sense of shame, right? But at the same time, I think the reasons why people keep things harsh is more about my reputation and how people will see me. Because remember that when you're going through difficulty, even like take for example, and, and again, keeping on our topic, right? So I keep things harsh, harsh. And then the next thing, you know, you haven't sat down, you, you haven't sat your children down to explain to them what's going on. And then the one day the child comes home and says, oh, mommy, someone's, someone at school told me that they know that you and daddy are getting a divorce or something of that sort, right? So they're getting the information from outside of the home. And this is why I say, again, it's so important to sit your children down and communicate. But the, again, it's about the intention. They and have if to you do can't, if you believe that you're not going to do uh, a good enough job, if you believe that you're going to perhaps break down, become emotional, or you're just not the type of person, you're not a good communicator, how then do you prepare your child, again, mm. depending on the child's age, to suggest that things have been very bad these past few months or these past few years in our home, we all need a bit of help and um, 
we hope that you can go for some play therapy because it's going to help you put things into perspective. How does that conversation okay. happen? I don't think I'll do justice to this program if I don't mention one very important thing. And it leans towards I, something I mentioned in the previous program. Counseling is a process. Now remember when I mentioned that sometimes parents would drop their children off like the child is the problem and how important it is for parents to do parenting sessions. Now when we talk about parenting sessions, we're talking about it has nothing to do with the marital relationship. So when we do parenting sessions, if I'm the counselor, for example, then I don't tackle the marital stuff. I only tackle things around, and even people who are together can do parenting sessions because we have different parenting styles, maybe uh, the way we communicate and all of that. So it's about co-parenting. But why I'm going towards this is that when I talk about counseling being holistic and in a process, we also talk about, so going back to your question, so if a mother is struggling or father for that matter to sort this out you you need counseling if you need to identify that something's going on right remember that you can only be an effective parent if you okay I can only function well even aside from parenting I can only be a fully functioning human being or even a relatively fully functioning human being if I am okay here so if I'm struggling and I know and you know what I have, to, I have to take my hat off. It's not easy to be a parent in today's times. You have your stuff, and then you have to think about your children. And, and even this, we see this even when trauma or bereavement happens, you struggling, now you have to put up a brave front. Are you the support structure? Do I, do I not cry? Do I show my weakness? So there is a space for adults to go and sort their stuff out in counseling. And when we, what we call a position of strength, and if I say, okay, now, I'm okay. You, you can't always be fully okay. We have good days, we have bad days. But if I'm going for counseling and I'm seeing to myself, it makes me better equipped because I'm developing my coping mechanisms, um, I'm getting support, I'm self-nurturing maybe, um, I'm growing as a person, I know what I want, I'm a bit clearer emotionally, I'm more stable. It puts me in a better position to say, okay, now I can sit with my children and I can be an effective parent and play my part better. But I can't send my child for counseling when I say there's nothing wrong with me, but the very reason my child is going for counseling is because of what's going on here. The other problem that we pick up is um, conflict situations or young people and even adults, old adults, old couples that have been together for many years, they don't have conflict resolution skills in place. So if mom and dad haven't displayed those skills, obviously your kids are going to grow up not being able to resolve any form of conflict and then just have a big blow up every time things, every time they're not understood or every time things don't go their way. You know, Julie, there's a whole different program on how your parenting today affects children's relationships in the future and conflict resolution is one of those. So it's what we call learned behavior. So if I see that conflict as a child, if I see that my parents resolve conflict by screaming, shouting, swearing, that's what I'm going to do. And the reality is that, and you know, we have a big problem with bullying and educators and, and, and um, professionals who are working in the, the education sector will vouch for me when, when I say that that they're seeing a lot of the domestic stuff come to the school and teachers are not equipped or they don't have the time to deal with each child's domestic stuff but unfortunately what happens is if my child is having difficulty and they don't know how to control their anger because myself and my husband are at it all the time then my child goes to school and takes out his frustration on another child and then we have a problem of bullying and the bullying also takes the form of, and I know we side like a little bit, but in a way it is keeping with the topic because we're looking at what are the effects on the children when parents are going through marital breakdown. So again then that child goes to school, hits another child or threatens another child to steal something and that's where we get the problem of bullying and even abusive relationships because 
they're not learning proper anger management skills or they're not learning and in another very very important thing that we don't we don't pay enough attention to is also gender roles so gender perceptions so if my father disrespects my mother do I either see that it is okay so if I'm a male do I grow up thinking that's how women should be treated or is it that I become defensive and I become protective over my mother because I didn't like the way my father treated my mother. So these different things. So we have to be conscious of the messages we're sending out to our children. And I can't tell you how important that is. And sadly, when you talk about gender roles, we're seeing a lot of that playing out. I mean, society is absolutely rife with these type of breaking stories on a daily basis. We are overloaded as far as gender violence issues issues are concerned, um, women being beaten up, women being abused mentally, physically, emotionally, women being raped, married and unmarried women being raped. And that's all of, that's a social evil. And that, what is that telling us about those males that are perpetrating those atrocities? Um, I think it says a lot about um, how little respect we have for each other and you know when i look at it in, in and i know we, we we're going on to a, a topic about you know gender relationships but i think it is relevant it's it, it ties it's in relevant. with what we're talking about because mm. if i'm in an abusive relationship and my little child sees mm. me being abused on a regular basis he's going to grow up thinking that's how i treat women that's how i resolve conflict because he doesn't know any other way he doesn't know any other way and he he thinks that that's that's acceptable and that it's okay. But on the flip side, I must also say that sometimes you do get men becoming protective over their mums and they feel they need to compensate. And this affects the future. You know, we get the mother-in-law syndrome and then we'll say, oh, the mother-in-law is, is, comes first because now the son does everything for his mum because he feels an obligation. And again, it's something about what we spoke about earlier. So if the mum is having problems with the husband and from a young age, this boy is little and she starts telling him, your dad did this and your dad did that and he takes on the male figure. Protective role. He starts protecting her from the young age and so that's a boundary crossed, right? Because the expectation is that he is going to be my guardian growing up. And so he grows into that role and then that affects his marital relationship later on because again the boundary has been crossed. This is just to give you an example how things could go so either complex. way. So complex. Yes, it goes and you know in most instances abusive relationships end up in extreme behaviors. So you'll either get a perfectionist who always needs an approval and, and some siblings obviously deal with their parents um, let's say unfavorable behavior um, in different ways. So I, for example, let's say again, uh, might identify more with my mom because she was treated in a certain way and maybe feel like I need, in my own marriage, I'll um, maybe respond to my husband because my mom didn't respond to my dad the way she's supposed to. And then my sister might have had a very good relationship with my, with her, uh, with, with my dad. And so she's quite okay with, um, my dad but maybe she's got resentment issues against my mom for whatever reason so it's all about each child is different and again you know when it comes to basics on parenting it's about building relationships with your children keeping the lines of communication open teaching them how to express themselves positively teaching them but how do we teach them when we ourselves have not Are learned broken. those <laughs> And unfortunately, we have to stop there. Interesting as it is, we have run out of time. Hope to pick up again with Islamic uh, Care Line the next time they're here with us. Let's go for an ad break. And when we come back, we'll be continuing our discussions on Let's Talk. Welcome back and this time around we're going to be talking about the green spaces around us 
our responsibility as citizens in keeping a beady eye on the green spaces. What I'm talking about is city parks, the streets, uh, the trees on the streets in and around Johannesburg. For this interview, we're focusing on the Johannesburg Metropole, but I think the same rules would apply throughout South Africa and parks all around in our country. I have the lovely Jenny Moodley from Johannesburg City Parks and Zoo to talk to us about what we take for granted, but just how much of money and hard work goes on behind the scenes to keep our cities beautifully green. Morning, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Julie, for having us. And morning to you. Viewers. Thank you indeed for being here. Absolutely. I think you guys play a very important role in our lives, albeit we're not even aware of the fact that you are greening our suburbs, you're greening our streets, our parks, and take such good care of our parks and these beautiful recreational environments. So Johannesburg, uh, city parks and zoo just how big an operation is it yes. and jenny you are the official spokesperson and communications person for city parks absolutely yes thank you so much well basically not many people know that uh, we have over 2157 parks in our city um, that's wow. just Johannesburg. Okay. Some of them, we, we've categorized them in three uh, different categories. You have your flagship facilities, and these are your zoo lakes, your Florida lakes, your Rhodes Parks, your Rose Park in Lanasia, and these are your flagship facilities. We then have what we call pocket parks. These are your neighborhood parks, and these are your parks around the corner, which has got some playground equipment and so on. And then finally, you would have undeveloped parks. So these, bearing in mind, we need to still keep intact because this is for future generations. We've got growing urbanization in the city, so it's extremely important to safeguard these spaces for future use. Um, so bearing in mind that these are just our parks, we've also got conservation areas. These are all your nature reserves, and this is your Clip Riversburg Nature Reserve, your Klufendal Nature Reserves, your bird sanctuaries, and so on. It falls under city parks' as responsibility. And then we have over 38 cemeteries. These are your formal cemeteries in the city, uh, bearing in mind that 28 of these cemeteries are now considered dormant, meaning they've reached full capacity for primary burials. That's a huge problem, not only locally, but globally, yeah. where there isn't enough space, land space, to accommodate uh, yeah. for cemeteries. Yeah. What is City Parks doing about it? Well, we've got a three-pronged program. So we currently we have four active or open cemeteries, and this is your West Park, your uh, Deep Sloot Cemetery, your cemetery in Midrand, and then of course a brand new cemetery, Olifant's Flay, in the southern quadrant of the city. So we'd like to allay any concerns and say we've got adequate burial space for over 1.5 million graves in the city, even if there's a natural disaster. So first and foremost is to say to residents, we've got adequate burial space. However, we don't want future generations to bear the burden of managing dormant cemeteries as cemeteries fill up. So for us, it's very important to start considering alternatives. And one of which we found that doesn't have much stigma is using a family grave to rebury or to bury a, a loved one. So for instance, if my mum has passed on, there's no reason why I can't be buried in that same grave. So how long, um, what sort of time span do you allow for that grave to be reopened for the next generation or the next family member to be buried in that grave? And what are the protocols involved mm -hmm. in making that request? Yes, so you could firstly, right at the beginning, in terms of your first burial, you could say we'd like to uh, uh, process that grave and uh, create a, a much deeper grave. Bearing in mind at this stage we're going between three and four graves, uh, sorry, three and four burials in the same grave. So within a year, it's the only time you can, uh, sorry, not within a year, just over a year is what it will take to reopen that grave. You cannot do it within the one year period and that's for health reasons. Obviously. So we create it where we put in limestone and so on when we uh, when we opening the, the grave for the second or the third or the fourth burial. 
So it's very, it's affordable. It affords uh, families an opportunity to create one central point to to conduct rituals and prayers and so on. Um, it's I know it's happening currently at the nuclear cemetery, absolutely. and a, a lot of Muslim families mm. are opting for that yes. as uh, an alternative. Very much so, and I think there's so much dignity in terms of creating this space where there's a greater level of ownership also we're finding, where families are coming together with the younger members of the family uh, during Ramadan and so on, and they, you know, in terms of their prayers, they're conducting it at the same space. Mm. So for us, it's, it's going to have huge implications in terms of uh, burial space in the city. Of course, the most important is cost effectiveness. Um, secondly, just creating uh, sanctity in our cemeteries, creating this tranquility, re restoring the integrity of our cemeteries. So for that, it's very, very important for families to, to understand and appreciate. Then, of course, uh, if there are no uh, issues in terms of religious concerns, there's been an increase in cremations. We're finding that uh, both our uh, cremators in Lanasia and in uh, Bramfontein and Bricks and uh, Bramfontein are being utilized. We've seen a spike in the number of cremations. And then what we're saying to families is also look at the reduction burials. So where you've had a grave in the family of a loved uncle or grandparent and so on for many years, where you could reduce those remains, put in a smaller uh, receptacle like an urn, and of course, uh, use that same gravesite for family again. Now, you spoke about Olifants Fontaine being the new cemetery, but wasn't that um, area flood damaged with the recent rains? Absolutely. And what are you guys doing to restore it? Well, Olifants uh, Flay Cemetery. So, what's happened is we found that. Prior to developing a cemetery, you need to bear in mind your land must be as good as you would use for housing, for example. It's extremely important from a health concern, bearing in mind your groundwater, your high water tables and so on can contaminate uh, can be contaminated. Mm -hmm. So for us, when we did the environmental impact assessment, we found that that land was uh, was um, uh, suitable. Uh, suitable for for a cemetery. However, the rains were quite incessant. It, it was over a short period of time, and bearing in mind that we'd just excavated a whole series of graves in the same section. So for us, it's about decentralizing it at this stage, creating different sections without um, too many burials in one particular s section where you're then creating that, that overload where the water is gushing into some of these grave sites. So we're looking at how we, uh, we plan our burials uh, by decentralizing it throughout the cemetery. Uh, having said that, we're also appealing to families. Uh, Custom-wise, we come in there and quite often we continue to create um, uh, the, uh, the grave, adding more sand and so on. And we find that during rains, this washes away. So we'd like to create a more compact a grave site and what we're doing is looking at, at those sort of ways of how we can help families make sure that these graves are compact. The, the uh, other element we found is that tombstones are being erected too soon. We have, in terms of our bylaws, we've said to families, you have to wait for a 12-month period before you erect a headstone or a tombstone. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of tombstones and headstones were found collapsed due to the, the rains. All right, let's move on mm -hmm. to the softer side yeah. of city parks and Johannesburg Zoo. Is it a fact or is it a myth that Johannesburg is the largest man-made forest in the world? And as we speak, Johannesburg... Um, there are about 3.5 million trees in and around Johannesburg. Um, yes, uh, we'd like to say that it's, as far as we know, it's one of the biggest man-made forests um, in uh, globally. Uh, we also know that in terms of the 3.2 million trees found on our streets, there's an additional 6 million found in private properties. So my, my figure of 3 point million is thrown out the window. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we need so, to go back to the mining era where right. uh, a lot of the, uh, in terms of the mining, using the, the, your, your invasives, unfortunately, your water guzzlers, they were planted uh, quite extensively in the city of Joburg. So even your beautiful Why jacaranda. Was Why was that? And I'm thinking black wattles, jacarandas, they're beautiful to look at but the mess they create yes. and other damage because of their root systems etc. 
Um, why were, was that through sheer ignorance or the immigrants that came 100 and 200 years ago and settled here in South Africa just brought a piece of their souls from their yeah. own mother countries to South Africa? Well, it was primarily for the mining industry, bearing in mind you needed, the, when you tunneled into the ground, you needed a solid, fairly long uh, Root pieces systems. of wood yes. to actually create this, um, this uh, the, the construction of a mining area, um, a mining dump. So, of course, what had happened was a lot of people had brought in these massive trees so they could create uh, this, the, the, the infrastructure for the mining industry. And then, of course, a lot of people brought in exotics uh, from their home countries. So you'll find that a lot of the trees on, in private spaces in the city of Joburg are exotic trees. Doesn't mean that they're water guzzlers or invasives, but they're not indigenous to South Africa. How much of a risk is that to our environment? Because I'm sure you've heard of Tim Neary, the environmentalist. Yes, yes. He was on my show a short while mm -hmm. ago. And according to him, he doesn't think it's a problem. And yet I hear that we should try and get rid of all the aliens, yeah. all the alien species um, from our private gardens and obviously our public spaces. Your thoughts? You know, um, I, I would say let's focus on the big for your bugweeds and so on. These are really your water guzzlers. But in terms of exotics and so on, they attract the bird life. They bring in an, an added element. For example, jacarandas, which is your lovely purple haze Gorgeous. over that. That is considered a category one invasive. However, um, the Department of Environmental Affairs have resolved that as much as it won't be eradicated, they would also make sure that residents don't plant uh, more jacarandas. So sadly, over the years, we need to bear in mind that these trees also have a lifespan between 100 and 150 years. So many of these beautiful trees will be lost due to it, uh, old age. Old age. <laughs> <laughs> let's leave it there. We're going but, for our first but again, ad break. Beautiful tree canopies, and we're appealing to residents let's plant those fruit okay, trees. Okay, let's, let's go for an it. ad break. Jenny Moodley from Johannesburg City Parks and Zoo is in studio talking to us about our beautiful city, Johannesburg, things you should know about your um, area, your private gardens, and the public spaces, and what you as a concerned citizen can do to keep the city as beautiful as it is. We have upwards of six million, I'm not exaggerating, this is the figure given to me by Jenny, six million trees in Johannesburg. This includes parks, streets, um, street trees, and um, trees obviously on small holdings and private gardens. And she confirms, I've always had this notion that it might be a myth, but Jenny confirms that Johannesburg is in fact the largest man-made forest globally. Bismillah rahman rahim and welcome back. We're talking about something very close to my heart, city parks, trees and the environment with Jenny Moodley. She's the spokesperson of Johannesburg City Parks and Zoo. And I think we've got lots to learn from this interview. And hopefully after the interview, we're going to become more active as far as the greening and uh, just taking care of our environment is concerned. Mm -hmm. Jenny, how big a role do we play as citizens, as lay people? absolute critical that we get communities involved. Your public spaces need collective action. And I think as you know, city parks as an entity of government, we can only do so much. And you're non-profit, aren't you? We are non-profit. Number one. And number two, what do you do about, do you still have, I know when I was growing up, there used to be a lot of issues around vandalism in uh, city park spaces. Is that still a big issue? If anything, it's increased quite oh, drastically. No. We're more prone to theft of our fencing, anything of value in terms of metal. Uh, we're finding that, uh, bearing in mind in some areas, it's actually over-utilization because of the f 
so little parks in, in your number inner city, for example. And so based on number of people versus number of facilities, we're finding that we have, are giving, getting reports of more vandalism, um, theft of uh, some of our playgrounds. We did two brand new parks in the inner city recently. And unfortunately, uh, just in the build up and just post, we found that sections of the fence went missing. Oh, no. Similarly, there, there was some graffiti and uh, somebody had come in and sought some of the free to use outdoor gyms. So we're creating this sort of outdoor experience and we're finding more and more there's a need for our budgets to look at security. And Which is such a shame. It's so sad. The money could be used elsewhere, better Absolutely. used elsewhere. Um, we talked endangered species just now and you've reassured the public that if they do have jacarandas in their midst, not to worry mm -hmm. because um, they will still go on thriving in those areas as long as you don't plant any more of those. Yeah. You also spoke about the, um, some crane, I think it was, wattle crane. Yeah. It's, uh, what's that, a weed, No, no, the wattle crane, it's the bird, but oh, the, the, the black wattle. The black it, wattle, of course. Yes, the black wattle, definitely invasive. And we've got an eradication program. We're working closely with Working for Water at national government level, where it's not only got a, uh, uh, the aim is not only to eradicate invasives, but also to create much needed jobs. So we finding we are going in areas where we are, are um, uh, limited with resources. We're working together with national departments to eradicate some of this. We're also looking at seasonal fire burns uh, where you would create uh, around a copy, for example, around a nature reserve. It's extremely Makes important. Makes sense, obviously. It's extremely important that we, we uh, do these fire breaks and in the event of fires. And they controlled, of course, controlled fires. That's right. So uh, these are some of the, uh, the issues when it comes to trees. We've also had a recent outbreak or an infestation of what we call the shot hole borer. So it's a minute beetle that embeds its larva uh, under the bark of a tree. And then once this um, larva work their way through, they then, uh, 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 it's called the ambrosia beetle. It creates a pinhead sort of uh, hole into the bark of the tree. And so we ask residents to look at your trees, both inside your private property and outside, and let's report that. Send us an so email. So what would you do about it? Well, there is outside setting this tree alight, which we don't want to because we're finding that there are uh, pockets of areas like your hurlinghams and so on that are reporting um, uh, quite a number of in, uh, trees that have been infested. What the shot hole borer does is we find a host tree and then we find that that you need to get to the beetle ASAP. There's no pesticide at this stage that can deal with this. Uh, we know that it's caused huge damage in, in California, for example. It's, it, they say it's come from uh, the Asian continent. We don't know exactly when and where, but we do know that one of the ways to deal with it is firstly to report it, and then secondly to uh, let's um, deal with it through a, a fire burn if we have to. But uh, at this stage, we're hoping that like with any of these outbreaks, it goes through its natural cycle and then there's a natural resistor that comes on board. What is happening in terms of the environment is you're finding that they are prone to a particular overpopulation of a particular bug and so on. And uh, because of rains, limited rains and so on, this could also um, impede uh, uh, the, the actual uh, explosion of, of the population. So we're working closely with the, our um, research organizations, your universities and so on, to see how we can contain this, uh, the beetle. But at this stage, we're saying to residents, let's first and foremost identify if you have it in your spaces and send us an email on trees at jhbcityparks.com. Okay. The greening of Soweto ah, began yes. a couple of years ago. Mm. How successful is that and is it still going to be ongoing? I understand that you guys, the, the aim was to plant over 200,000 trees in and around Soweto, is that correct? Absolutely. So we did this all in the build-up to the 2010 FIFA World Cup, bearing in mind there was a huge uh, momentum around the game, there was euphoria, everybody was excited and so on. And we thought that could act as a catalyst for socio-economic development in, greater so in, in the greater Soweto area. And what the city did under the previous mayor, um, Masondo, was champion greening. So we'd gone in there, taken a park, 
done some very innovative, creative, working with community initiatives like your extreme park developments. So where we'd go in, do three months of boardroom planning, but do a 24 hour park. So we do all the concrete, the pathways and so on in the build-up, but laying the lawns, putting in the playground equipment, uh, making sure that um, the final fixtures, the painting of uh, some of the fencing and so on was done by communities and schools. And we found that through this program we were able to secure the buy-in. Some of your parks, like Tokosa Park, is amazingly beautiful. You visit it over a weekend and over any summer weekend you can have over 10,000 people in this wow. facility. Let's understand for the benefit of our viewers the importance, uh, well, number one, how successful mm -hmm. was the greening of Soweto? Is it, it's, I should imagine, still ongoing. Absolutely. And number two, the purpose mm -hmm. of greening your areas, what is it doing for our environment? Here we're talking over 6, 000, um, six, no, six, million, mm. six million trees in Johannesburg. Yeah. What's it doing for our health and well-being? Well, we found just through, let's take uh, the Orlando West Park, for example, right opposite the Orlando Stadium. And that was a landfill site. It was a dumping area. And you, we'd reclaimed it, put in this uh, multifunctional park with outdoor uh, equipment, an indoor soccer field, uh, a massive place to play soccer as well. We put in some very innovative playground equipment. But what we found in the build-up to the launch was residents living on the peripheral, on the uh, outskirts of the park, were cleaning up their spaces. They were renovating their homes. There was this greater level of ownership and pride. And we found that parks, as singularly, singularly can reclaim the dignity of communities. And, and I'm thinking what it's doing for our health. I mean, that many trees in your immediate environment and grass, etc. Mm -hmm. um, it works as a natural, nature's filter for all the toxins in the air, does it not? Absolutely. You know, uh, uh, planting trees and developing parks, uh, huge health benefits, the reduction on your medical, uh, the, your country's medical bills, uh, environment mental access a natural filter system um, even can combat accidents because night oncoming vehicular light uh, in the night if it's barricaded by a concrete barricade can in the event of an accident cause fatalities and so on whereas if you had a softer barrier with the hedging and so on that can absorb the impact also make drivers uh, ensure driver safety so it's got far-reaching implications from uh, from health basic health benefits all the way to growing your economy. It can increase property values. We found that trees, uh, neighborhoods with tree-lined streets are more likely to sell at much oh, higher prices than... Very definitely. <laughs> than, it pretties up the area. Absolutely. It, it does amazing things as far as aesthetics is concerned. Mm -hmm. Your um, your department or city parks runs, and you are non-profit, but you run on a budget of approximately 985 million rand per annum. Mm -hmm. And um, we know it sounds a lot, mm, yeah. but broken down, it just isn't enough to go around. Yes. That being said, and I'm not sure if this falls under the ambit of city parks, but perhaps it's something you want to look at, is the ugly eyesore and that is those um, mine dumps. Yes. Do you guys have any idea of how to pretty up those areas? Because it comes at a huge mm. risk. It's a health hazard. Absolutely. I think first and foremost, in terms of the budget, we need to bear in mind that we are a labor intensive organization. Uh, excuse me, we've got um, horticultural services that must be manually undertaken. So a lot of that budget goes towards your staffing costs, your salaries and so on. The balance of the budget we need to understand managing this huge portfolio. So, um, so we become more and more contractor dependent, creating these small medium enterprises, taking them through what we call the Greening Academy that's in-house and then going through the training, managing your business from a financial perspective and so on. So there's this sort of element happening quite extensively at Joburg City Parks and Zoo. But going back to in terms of mine dumps, we need to understand that many of these mine dumps have now again become dormant. And one of the ways to decommission a mine dump is to make sure that the Department of Mineral Affairs officially decommissions it. So you can't enter. For example, we've got the George Harrison Park, which was one of the 
first um, along the main reef, which was where the first gold was actually found. And we finding that it's now still being um, accessed illegally for illegal mine harvesting, uh, gold harvesting. Mm. So we're saying we cannot, as Joburg City Parks and Zoo, enter this area without the proper permits and so on. Of course, on. yes. Uh, a lot of it is still in, in private hands, these uh, these. Um, Can you put up. pressure on them to start greening up the area? Because it's definitely a health hazard. Uh, uh, you know, we're working closely mm. with environmental departments. It's it's a big concern. We're finding that some of a natural greening is taking place in some of these areas. But you're quite right. We can be doing so much more and we aren't, and we should be. All right, let's take an ad break. When we come back, I want to concentrate on one of my favorite spots in Johannesburg, and that, of course, is the Johannesburg Zoo and the amazing work mm, being you. undertaken there. Lovely. Jenny Moodley is my guest. We're talking about this amazing city of ours, Johannesburg. It is the largest man-made forest globally, and when we come back from the ad break, we're going to talk about the role of Johannesburg Zoo in our lives. Welcome back and we have a few minutes more to talk with Jenny Moodley from uh, Johannesburg City Parks and Johannesburg Zoo. Let's talk about this amazing space where we can all go to relax and unwind. How big a role or how big uh, of the budget does the Johannesburg Zoo take mm -hmm. as far as running the city is concerned? Uh, I don't have the exact figures, but I know when we did amalgamate or include the zoo into Joburg City Parks because they were two standalone entities. Were you entities. excited about the amalgamation? Absolutely. I think, you know, there was definitely areas where we could come together in terms of support services and so on. Uh, the aim was try to reduce costs of running both entities and, and so on. And I think certainly Joburg City Parks and Zoo has made huge strides in terms of uh, containing the costs, management costs. Uh, but having said that, it definitely needs a unique management style. I think you're looking at animals, you need to understand the zoo is very much a conservation education site. Uh, uh, sometimes our visitors expect to see animals entertaining them. Nope, you will go to the circus for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are a conservation area. Our animals are sometimes nocturnal, so they're not always very active um, and so on. But bearing in mind that the zoo is still the most popular outdoor recreation space in the city of Joburg. Uh, it continues to get over 400,000 visitors per annum, focusing largely on school groups. We uh, bus in children through the Masimbambisani uh, program, which is where, which is? Which is where um, children that are, uh, don't have uh, the, the financial ability to visit a zoo are provided with transport, sometimes a meal, and they access a zoo at no cost. When you compare the Johannesburg Zoo with zoos around the world, mm -hmm. uh, when, how do we rate? Well, uh, we can, you know, certainly we in, we have the big five experience. Not many zoos in the heart of a of a city, an urban city like ourselves, can claim that they you can go in around on your doorstep, basically in close proximity to your home, and see the big five. Uh, so definitely some some uniqueness in terms of that. Uh, we also found that in our conservation programs, uh, for example, the, the hospital, the veterinary services and so on, have been award-winning uh, nodes inside the Joburg Zoo. We have an external um, internship for foreign students coming through. So at this stage, I think we on par. We've got our PESA accreditation, which is uh, accreditation only if you meet certain criteria to the Pan-African Association of Zoos and Aquaria. Uh, we also affiliated to WAZA, which is the World Association of Zoos, and you can only belong to these organizations if you comply with their very strict standards. So bearing in mind that there's uh, pr programs in place from an education, environmental concern, and of course then we have the recreation. And what we'd like to see is uh, more feet coming into the zoo. We want families to continue to visit. It's very accessible. Is it affordable? Uh, currently, it's 70 rand. I think it's 71 rand with the VAT going up. <laughs> it, it's 71 rand, and then we have for children and for pensioners a discounted rate. Uh, 
Uh, so, or you could buy an annual pass. We find neighbors that are taking part in the zoo, monthly zoo trot, for example. They'd like to come in and so they buy an annual pass, which is very affordable at 651 Rand per pass. Uh, it allows you free parking and access to all the events and so on. Um, and again, um, we're finding that the zoo's got some of the conservation programs, the wattle crane, for example. We've had, uh, we've had a birth of the first puppet-reared wow. crane. Um, the, uh, we've had uh, two new lion cubs uh, born at the zoo. We've had some tigers. We've got the wild dogs. And also very important is the animals of the Amazon. This is probably if you're a Joe Burger and you haven't traveled to the Amazon. It, and if you have, it would be a rare sighting in the Amazon itself. But we have what a, a, a massive exhibition called the Animals of the Amazon, where you can see your boas and your anacondas, and you can see your, um, your so colorful... Absolutely lots to see lots and do see. at the zoo. It's almost wrap up time. Let me just ask you very quickly, challenges and what type of reporting are you expecting mm -hmm. um, Joe Burgers to you know, to report and interact with you as a company, Johannesburg City Parks and Zoo. What type of issues should, um, you know, they be encountering, which is big enough or maybe mm. important enough to be brought to your attention? I think there, there are a few elements. One is in terms of challenges, yes obviously resource challenges, bearing in mind there are more competing needs in the city, basic services such as housing, water, electricity must always take priority. So having to ask the city to set aside more funding for parks in uh, where there's so much inequality is just uh, not conducive to running a, a city properly. So we become more and more dependent on private sector partnerships. We're working closely with business, but we're saying to residents, become part of campaigns like the Ari Sebet saying, which is the third Saturday of the month. Go out there with your neighbors, clean up that pocket park in your area, do some deep cleaning, or even as basic as just cleaning the space outside your wall, outside your doorstep, uh, outside mm -hmm. your entrance cut that grass, let's make Joburg look amazingly a world beautiful, class city. a world-class city. Um, so yes, opportunities for partnerships, uh, we want people to use our facilities, let's get the events out, if you're an events organiser, let's use our parks to host these Sorry, events. Sorry, and that's where we have to leave it, yeah. um, and obviously if people need more information they can just go to your website. Website, absolutely. Jenny, it's been fascinating Thank you, and Jenny. very informative talking to you, and uh, we're so proud mm -hmm. of Johannesburg City Parks and the zoo, and hopefully people are going to be coming out in their droves to visit the zoo and start taking action, become mm. proactive about their immediate surroundings. That was Jenny Moodley from Johannesburg City Parks and Zoo and it's amazing when you sit and talk to people to realize just how big their portfolio is and how big a role they play in our lives in making our spaces healthy, happy and beautiful. Still to come, Rabia Khan to talk about the plight of the Kashmiris. And welcome back from uh, the beautiful green city parks here in Johannesburg. We now move to the north of India and we go to a region that's been really uh, at the heart of the problem for three countries, China, Pakistan and India. And this small pocket of land is called Kashmir and almost 70 years later, the issue has still not been resolved. Let's understand what exactly is the problem at stake here in Jammu, Kashmir and Ladakh, which are the three parts that make up the whole of Kashmir and why is there this strife and this fight of ownership of a region called Kashmir. Rabia Khan, salamu alaikum, welcome wa to the program. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi. You are a, an activist, that's what you call yourself. You hail from Pakistan. You've been in South Africa for the past 20 years. Yes. But you're very active for the, if I can say, the freedom of Kashmir. But in my intro, you heard me suggesting that there are three countries that are claiming ownership of this pocket of land called Kashmir. 
What exactly is the story there? And why are you as a Pakistani so involved and passionate about the Kashmir story? Okay, Jazakallah giving me this opportunity. The first thing I want to say, like uh, uh, in Pakistan, if we are going that side. So I think the people's born as pro-Palestine and pro-Kashmir. It is just in our blood because that Kashmir is right at our doorstep. But right now, uh, what is my more focus uh, is about humanitarian work, relief work, which is not allowed in Kashmir. So that I was trying to discuss more about the suffering of peoples. But if we go back to 1947, when uh, British rule uh, ended in India, and it left uh, new dominion uh, states, mostly uh, Hindu and uh, Muslims, India and Pakistan. But we should remember there were more than 560 princely states as well. So they were free to live on their own. But uh, among them, there was a case of dispute uh, only in three states. So in two of these states, uh, Hyderabad and Junagar, uh, where the ruler was Muslims, but majority of peoples were Hindu. When this partition happened, so they, they hesitated or refused to sign an uh, instrument of accessions to India. But the overwhelming peoples, uh, majority Hindus, they were willing to stay with India. So in that case, uh, India felt uh, to justify it in and they march in their troops to these two states and uh, annexing the territories. But you see, Julie, when it comes to Kashmir, it was very different case from the other two. The Kashmir was uh, the largest of the all states. All right, when you talk about the other two, you're talking about Ladakh and Jammu. We are talking about Jammu. Uh, and Kashmir, mm. right? Kashmir and Jammu state. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we should uh, be clear here is not a territor territorial issue. It's not about territory or war um, um, among India and Pakistan or China. China is already out. He got his sight and he's out. We are not talking about the territorial issue. It's a humanitarian issue. Like I said so, Kashmir was but you free are state. Here, you are here to talk about the humanitarian issue, but it still is, as we speak exactly. now, it is a territorial issue, is it not, between Pakistan and India? It's not, actually. It's not. You see, like I said, so it was princely state. And the, what is the unique and different uh, circumstances with Kashmir uh, uh, besides the other princely states? They witnessed in... Uh, an open revolt against a Hindu ruler already in 1946, long before uh, like a 47 when the, uh, uh, India and Pakistan were separated. So it is not like that. They were independent and they want to be independent. You're referring to Gulab Singh. He Maharaja bought, Ranjit Singh. Right, he bought um, uh, much of the territory he bought, didn't he? paid money for that territory, am I correct? You, you see now, uh, where is that proof? The first thing. Uh, the, uh, the second thing, don't mind me saying, it was his father's property. Ah. He sold Kashmir to Hindus, what, what it was. What was the right he had? Because the Kashmir was independent state. Only the thing is, a divide and rule came from British. We are still paying for that. So th that was the reason the majority, 97% of overwhelming Muslim Kashmiri, they already witnessed in a, an open revolt against Hindu ruler, 1946 somewhere. Right, so who gave them him right, a 1% to sell that state to somewhere? No, nobody had that right. And before 1947, when it was decided the majority of Muslim states can be with Pakistan or majority of Hindus can be with uh, India. India, right? And even the free states or princely states can be independent. So what went wrong with Kashmir? Why they are not free or why they are not with the majority of Muslims country, Pakistan? 
I'm not discussing where they're supposed to be. Let them decide what they okay. want. Okay, let's hold that thought. We'll go mm. for our first ad break and we'll be back with you in a minute or two. So as you can hear, the issue seems to be much more complex than just an issue around territory. It's territory, it's religion, and it's the fact that someone decided that he is able to sell off or buy off what he wants. And this obviously is sitting very, very heavily on uh, the shoulders of current day Kashmiris. But Ravi has also indicated that it's an issue around humanitarianism. So let's look at that right after the ad break. Activist Rabia Khan, who is a Pakistani and has been living in South Africa for over 20 years, is talking to me about the Kashmiri issue and it really is very complex indeed. But this is an issue which is very close to her heart and she takes the humanitarian stance on the issue of Kashmir and she's here to talk about um, Kashmir, the people, and the situation playing out as you and I speak this morning. Back to you, Rabia, and you Jazakallah. insisting that it is a humanitarian issue. Let's understand why. Okay. Like I said, I am a human rights activist, right? So whatever is happening with the politicians and the all other uh, issues, so that is really complicated discussions. And if we go there, so uh, who's right and who's wrong, we're not going to be able to decide. It. But the point is, at the end of the day, who is suffering, right? What is the situation is. of the Kashmiri people? If you should visit there today, what are they saying to you? Mm. Whom do they want to be ruled by? Yes. And what yes. is their domestic situation like in terms of politics, job opportunities, education, hospitalization, all of that which right. makes up your social fabric. What right. does that look like? You see, sir, you must keep in your mind, uh, Kashmir is occupied by Indian forces for last 70 years, That's over right. 70 years, right? So in that kind of situation, you can understand and get the clear picture that what is the life of Kashmiris and been living. So situation is not as different as current situation in Palestine at the moment, you know, because of peoples of suffering. Uh, is in it Kashmir. as bad as Palestine? It is as bad. It is as bad. And the, uh, what is the confuse and the sad part of the, this picture, why international media is so quiet? There is scant uh, coverage from the international media. And yet it's a very sort of the holiday destination. Exactly. And people who go there for holidays come yes. back and paint a very rosy picture. Of course. Nobody talks about the political situation in the country. Nobody talked about it because they don't see it. When our guest comes, for example, uh, this uh, India summit is happening, where it is happening? In Sweater? Or is happening in center. <laughs> Obviously in the city of gold. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So that is the whole thing is, you know, the suffering of Kashmiris for the last 70 years. Nobody see it because it's a very misconcept uh, on international media. What they are uh, what they are telling to peoples about Kashmir, actually they are not saying anything, you know. All they say so is a fight between Pakistan and India. Now you are mentioning China as well. So Julie, what is the thing uh, uh, here we are discussing? Peoples are suffering in Kashmir. The first thing, nobody talked about it. There is no relief uh, work uh, allowed inside the Kashmir. If we believe and we know that for uh, uh, true, the Kashmir is a heaven on this earth. So why tourist is not free to go around in Kashmir wherever they want to go? They want to go to uh, domestic peoples, to local community. Why they are not allowed? If we come, let me come to the relief work first, then we can get the better picture. If you see relief work, nothing is happening in Kashmir. Only recently, okay, Al Jazeera is making little effort. Uh, the couple of uh, video clips we see now, what recent, what happened in Kashmir. So there was the only Red Cross at one stage. 
allowed to go at certain stage in inside the Kashmir, but they go into Kashmir only to limited area. Like they visit, they want to visit what's happening in Kashmir's prisoner. Why these people are here? What is the story behind it? So who take them to those prisoners and detentions? Very limited access. Uh, their own peoples, Indian officials, not local peoples. They are not allowed to talk to local peoples. I'm telling you out of my personal experience. Uh, so met some uh, white group. Uh, they were uh, impressed by some uh, uh, overseas carpets or you say the rights. And they were saying, so this is from Kashmir because it's very silky and this is all. So, but we went to Kashmir at certain uh, area and then we were allowed, said, we were told, you gonna stick with your guide, not going over the, this side or that side because it's not safe for you. So we are already giving that picture to international tourism, it's not safe. Okay, come to us, we will organize for you. So I'm trying to say, let it open, let it open for the world, let them see if it's a heaven on the earth, let them enjoy, let them see and socialize with local peoples and see what is going on there. Why, why it is so close? Because they are hiding what is happening behind those old pictures. What needs to be done to uh, free the Kashmir people, maybe independence or yes, whether yes. they decide to go you know, be governed by Pakistan or India, whatever yes. it is that they want to do. What are the majority of people on the ground saying, what do they want? What they do want. My personal opinion, if you are asking me. So I'm telling you that uh, India's first prime minister, 1947, when he realized he, Indian forces cannot fight against Kashmiri's uprising, right? So he decided to take this matter to Union Councils and United Nations, and he promised to have a free plebiscite in Kashmir. So till today, it's never okay. happened, never happened. So all I can say, just let, uh, let them have right of self-determination. Let them decide. As a human rights activist, I'm not suggesting anything for Kashmiri peoples, but I can see their suffering. So I want the whole peoples around. If you want to do some justice, you want to stand up for justice, stand up. Why are you choosing areas? This is my area, I'm, I'm NGOs, I'm from this group, I'm fighting for Palestine, I'm fighting for Syria. But you ever hear anybody mention Kashmir? No, it's very much under the radar. It's almost like a forgotten, forgotten struggle. So what is it that we should be aware of and what is it that you want us to come forward and help with? I really appreciate that question, <laughs> right? What I need, Julie, what I'm trying to say, like I do programs to create awareness. The first thing, lack of awareness. If there is no proper awareness, so people don't have interest. Like you said, so it's don't know, it's a between fight between three countries going on, but nobody is concerning what's happening to the people who are living there, you know? So what we need to do to create awareness. And the worst, what is my really, really wish? We could can bring some activist and leader from Kashmir. As a woman, I'm talking about on women's behalf. So I can suggest one very strong name from Kashmir, very amazing story behind her. It's a lady Parveen Ahangar. I'm very impressed of her. So if you allowed me, giving me little chance, I can tell you a little story about her. We need to be quick, we'll be running out of time okay. in a short while. This lady's son, Parveen's son, was uh, kidnapped. Uh, you know, the what you say, forced disappearance is very common in, uh, in Kashmir, uh, just like uh, rape uh, women's. So he was disappeared 20 years, seven, or almost 28 years ago, oh. right? And this woman is a very, very homely person. She don't speak even Urdu or English, anything but Kashmiri local language. This woman could not sit at home suffering for uh, his, her own son. She went door to door and knocked each door. Please come with me, go to police station and file this report. My son is disappeared. Your father is also disappeared. Your son is also disappeared. Join me. Long struggle, long struggle. 
but at one stage she organized 10000 people i can see this ADP is very hard for you mm. adp pd um, organization organizations of disappeared peoples in kashmir so she organized 10000 people at this very moment this woman traveled around the world she gave lecture how people are suffering in kashmir especially when your beloved are disappear i will strongly recommend it if we can organize a heart trip to south africa she can speak to people who wants to know about kashmir let her talk to them not on my behalf on her own behalf as a kashmiri activist actually i will call her mujahida she is a very strong man woman she even gave a lecture at oxford university obviously somebody translated for her so i'm trying to say the people are like her who, who not looking for name and fame unfortunately we have almost come to the end of the the show you wanting us as south africans to bring her here yes. let's hear the story first hand yes. and then maybe we can then start um campaign co- start doing something about uh, the f- freedom of freedom kashmir of the kashmiri people yes. are you then suggesting that some sort of a fundraiser be done to bring definitely, her over definitely definitely how do people get in touch with you uh like uh, pe- mostly people know me as a uh, activist but i can give my details my text number my email address is always available whoever wants to contact most welcome okay they can contact us here at itv we can pass on the in, uh, information yes. let's yes. bring her over through the collective yes. effort of south africans yes. they yes. need to dig deep into their hearts and their pockets to make a contribution Inshallah. to bring her here and Inshallah. let's hear the story first hand and then yes. we can mobilize yes. and help the people of kashmir as we've been helping people all around the world Mark. in war torn and oppressed countries like palestine like rohingya yes. like syria etc etc thank you for coming coming on the Just show i can now. see it's been very difficult for you you're there was, very emotional there was much more to say but it's okay inshallah next, next time, time. Next thank time. you for being here inshallah Pleasure. and Pleasure. we are behind you alhamdulillah jazakallah that was rabia khan uh, the activist uh, on behalf of the kashmiri people and as you can see she was very very emotional and she's here to talk about the unspoken story of the kashmiris she wants us all to band together dig deep into our hearts and our pockets make a contribution to bring the sister over from kashmir to come and share the story personally with us here in south africa so hopefully we can help lift the plight of the kashmiri people on that very sad and dark note we come to the end of the show today a big thank you to the very hard working production team thank you for your company until the next time as always it is khuda hafiz from me julie ali ya hala 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 ya